Well, I think, I mean, I think you're kind of bang on there on that kind of, you know, the photo ops. I mean, largely, I think that's what it is going to be is a symbolic thing. But I mean, that being said, it's a very, very important symbolic thing. I mean, this is Asia News Weekly, the podcast featuring news, commentary and analysis from the Asia Pacific region. North Korea, the South China Sea, and the trilateral meeting are on the table as East-West Institute's Jonathan Miller joins me for a discussion in this podcast. Plus stories from Hong Kong, India, and the Koreas are next. Hey everyone, Steve Miller here on this beautiful Friday, October 23rd, 2015. Thank you so much for joining me. Before we get into the news, a very slight program note. I'm heading out of town for the weekend. Going to take in some of the beautiful fall colors here in South Korea and visit the east coast of the country. So there won't be any new podcasts until Tuesday. But after that, things will resume. So now let's go ahead and get started with the podcast featuring a roundtable discussion with the region's major news. Sometimes the best way to paint a picture of what's going on in Asia is to simply sit down over a cup of coffee and chat about the relevant issues. Many times on a podcast, I'm joined by experts and we hone in on one specific issue, but not this week. Today, I'm joined once more by East West Institute's East Asia fellow, Jonathan Miller. Jonathan, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you, Steve. Always good to be on the podcast. So let's go ahead and begin with something that's on your side of the world. Last week, President Park and Hay met with U.S. President Obama and taking a look at what was released about the summit. I personally wasn't really impressed with anything that came through, uh, but I wanted to get your impression of that meeting. Did anything of substance materialize? Well, um, I think, I mean, from a symbolic standpoint, I think the meeting was important um, for South Korea after President Park had to cancel um, her trip uh, due to the, the MERS um, issue that was happening in the summer. So I think that was, um, there were some people, um, I think, in the U.S. administration that were, obviously, they were understanding of that. But I think uh, the logistics of how that got canceled, I think, um, didn't really look th that good. So I think that that was good, I think, uh, for South Korea to be able to arrange a visit in, um, before the end of this year. As far as substance, though, I mean, I similarly agree with you. Uh, on uh, North Korea, I mean, there was uh, a lot of statements about um, the mutual desire to engage with North Korea if, if North Korea was willing to engage. But uh, it, it seemed that both sides, especially um, uh, Obama, um, didn't seem to have a whole lot of hope into that. Uh, you know, uh, even the comparison to Iran um, saying that, you know, the, if North Korea was willing to kind of um, negotiate in faith as did Iran, then that would be something that the U.S. would look at. Um, I think Obama, you know, knows quite well that, that, that the situations are, are very different. So it seemed that it, to me, I didn't get a whole lot of, uh, of value in those type of statements because the, the situation between Iran and North Korea is so fundamentally different with uh, with the capability uh, of of the North having, um, you know, already having uh, made nuclear weapons t tests, and uh, so I think I I didn't see a whole lot of new stuff in in this summit. I wanted to get your opinion on the whole North Korean statement because time and time again we get statements from South Korea, we get statements from the United States asking North Korea to come back to the negotiation table, provided that they agree to give up their nuclear program, which they aren't going to do. And they flat out said, no, we, we aren't going to, to give it up. So why continuously say the same thing if the results are going to be the same? Yeah, no, it's, uh, it, it seems that both sides uh, have been talking past each other for some time. I mean, and then on the flip side, if you put that, uh, you know, you're right, you're right. Um, the, the denuclearization and just hammering that as a, as the only line, uh, it, it seems to not be working. And from the North Korean side, I mean, it's always the hostile policy is what they, they'll they refer to, the U.S. hostile policy. Um, and when they articulate that, you know, they refer to, um, you know, U.S. presence in South Korea, um, its deterrence commitments, um, and also lack of diplomatic relations. So I think that both sides just seem to have such unrealistic uh, 
um, preconditions uh, seemingly to uh, to get restarted. That it's uh, it seems to be uh, at a stalemate still. Uh, this past week, North Korea reached out to the United States and asked for a formal peace treaty, which of course Washington turned down straight away, saying that denuclearization needed to take place first. But it's been 60 years since the end of the Korean War. Is it time to finally look at that proposal, to open that door to see if we can get things moving forward? Or should denuclearization be the only pathway to peace? Well, I think, I mean, I think that's the eventual goal. I mean, obviously for um, for North Korea, I mean, I think even the U.S. is not, um, you know, opposed in principle to a, to a peace treaty, but I think it's under what terms. I think one of the biggest things that North Korea wants is that resumption of diplomatic uh, relations with the United States. And the U.S. sees that as such a uh, carrot, uh, such a, a massive uh, concession to give the North if there's nothing um, that is uh, some reciprocity there, especially on the nuclear program. That I, I don't think that that's something that's going to happen unless uh, unless there's something more comprehensive coming from the North. All right, let's switch gears a little bit. Uh, President Xi Jinping is in London this week. Uh, what's he hoping to achieve with this little charm tour to Europe? Well, it's very interesting, uh, Steve. Um, just reading a little bit about uh, about the visit and uh, and the meeting with um, with Prime Minister Cameron today. You know, one of the things that interested me the most about uh, the the growing UK China relationship is when this uh, when China's um, infrastructure bank uh, was created, um, and it was widely thought that they wouldn't get nearly as many um, states from the West and uh, U.S. allies and friends joining on. Uh, the UK was the first one to to indicate that, that it would uh, join as a founding member. So I think we kind of saw the signs, and, and I mean, there was many other signs that, in that relationship as well that showed that the UK really wanted to get a foothold um, with China early. So I'm um, from the UK side, I definitely see that, um, you know, despite some of their uh, disagreements with China on, uh, on on human rights and on security issues, um, I, I see why... Um, why they're angling this way, and I think from uh, China's perspective as well. I think it, you know. I think we'll, we might get into this later with ASEAN, but with all the bad press that China's had over the over the past year, with uh, things going on in the South China Sea, the East China Sea, uh, its troubles with neighbors, its troubles uh, sometimes with the U.S. I feel like it, it's looking to um, to improve its image, and I think that. Um, doing that with one of the U.S.'s uh, most important allies is a, is a, is a quite a strategic move. Okay, well, let's talk about ASEAN. This week, the offer was extended from Beijing to ASEAN member states to participate in naval drills in the South China Sea. And I wanted to get your opinion on this. If ASEAN members accept, does that in any way give legitimacy to China's claim over the South China Sea? And is well, is this really something that ASEAN members should do? Uh, yeah, from my uh, from my perspective, I mean, this is um, it just it, it seems largely a PR move from China. Again, um, you know, if you look back to last year's Shangri La dialogue, which is kind of the premier meeting of um, you know, defense ministers and defense analysts in Asia, um, I mean, China just took a bashing there uh, on uh, on the South China Sea. Um, you know, I think uh, the U.S. Defense Secretary made a, a quite a strong speech, uh, and this was amidst all the land reclamation activities that were happening in the South China Sea. So, this past year of, of bad press, of bad sentiment in the region, I think uh, China's trying to to back a little bit on that. Uh, in some senses, I think that that this is kind of where this is coming from, but I don't think we should overestimate. Uh, what this is too, because I mean, I think um, you know it, it is something that China is looking to for PR, but uh, the Southeast Asian states know that very well. Uh, so of course, they you know they may wish to hedge a little bit, and um, and they everybody wants a peaceful resolution here, but I don't think either side uh, feels that this is uh, moving moving any closer to uh, you know a comprehensive resolution of uh, of the the issues in in the South China Sea. But if the ASEAN member states decide to take up China on this offer. Would that essentially send a message that okay, the South China Sea is yours? We accept the nine dash line. Um, I mean, I I don't know that that would be a, that necessarily would imply that. And but to be honest, I think it would be interesting. I mean, I haven't seen uh, what the reaction has been in all the ASEAN member states, but 
uh, I imagine that it would be a fractured uh, group if anyone, if any, that uh, agreed to um, to participate in these drills. Because as we know, I mean, China traditionally has tried to kind of um, play on some of the divisions in ASEAN uh, for its uh, for its benefit, especially on this issue of the South China Sea. So whether uh, you know if if this wasn't to include, for example, Vietnam and the Philippines, then uh, would it hold much value at all? Uh, you know, so. Those are the things that I'll be looking at when I when I look at this. I, less of what uh, the Cambodias and and um, you know the Laoses say, and more about what the the Vietnams and the Philippines uh, um, think about this. Fair enough. Uh, if we come back to East Asia, the long-awaited trilateral meeting looks like it's actually going to come and take place here in Seoul. And I want to get your opinion on this. Can we really expect anything more than just photo opportunities and pleasantries? Do you really think that the sit-down between Pak, Abe, and Xi will do anything good, or is it simply too early to expect something? Well, I think, I mean, I think you're kind of bang on there on that kind of, you know, the photo ops. I mean, largely, I think that's what it is going to be is a symbolic thing. But, I mean, that being said, it's a very, very important symbolic thing. I mean, uh, it's something that we've been waiting for for, um, you know, since Abe's been, been elected, essentially, uh, in late 2012. Um, aside from that, though, there are some key, I think, um, you know, tangible things that, that could come out of this as well. I mean, one of them obviously is going to be the hopeful bilat uh, between Abe and, and Park, uh, aside from the, the trilateral meeting itself. So I think that is going to be something key to watch on. See, you know, again, what comes out of that? I don't know that there will be a whole lot more than, uh, than symbolism at this point. I don't, I'm not expecting a breakthrough in that first meeting, but, uh, the nature of having that meeting at all is 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 important. And one more thing, uh, kind of at the the substantive level, to me, is the um, the trilateral uh, the free trade talks that are going on between the three sides now. Because especially with the TPP being concluded now, and uh, Korea and China being on the outside of that agreement, and Japan uh, exhausting a lot of effort to get to that agreement past the goalposts. I think that it's going to be a very interesting discussion on that trilateral uh, FTA, which I think now is either at its ninth round or it's a. Uh, so it, they've been negotiating for a while. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see the discussions on that, whether there's more expediency uh, on that issue uh, now that the TPP is concluded. All right. Jonathan Miller over at the East West Institute, thank you so much for joining me this week. Thanks a lot, Steve. Now I'd love to hear from you. What are your predictions? for the upcoming trilateral meeting between China's President Xi Jinping, South Korean President Park Geun-hye, and Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Please, don't be shy. Send in your thoughts. And coming up next in the Friday edition of the Asia Brief, will Hong Kong police face justice? And of course, updates on the trial of Tatsuya Kato and the Great Wall of China. Late last week, seven Hong Kong police officers were brought in and charged for the beating of a protester during the pro-democracy demonstrations late last year. A police spokeswoman said the officers were charged with one count of attempting to cause grievous bodily harm with intent, while one other officer was charged with one count of common assault. The seven officers were accused of beating activist and civic party member Kin Cheng Kin Kao and video footage of that assault was released on the internet and it went viral. Following their hearing on Monday of this week, the officers were released on a bail of only 130 U.S. dollars. The magistrate in the case instructed the officers not to talk with the prosecution's 33 witnesses, many of whom are police officers. Their hearing is set to resume on November 17th. Cheng himself arrived at the courthouse to the sound of cheering supporters. He was charged with four counts of resisting arrest and one count of assaulting an officer. He could face up to two years in prison and his pre-trial hearing and his pre-trial hearing starts on December 9th. Cheng said following the hearing, quote, "I will stand tall and stay strong to fight for justice." End quote. Now, one has to wonder about the validity of the charges leveled against Chang. After all, he was hauled away and beaten on camera. Any charges of resisting arrest are absolutely ludicrous, as are those of assaulting an officer, because, you know, he was being beaten. 
To say that Hong Kongers will be watching these cases closely to see how they play out would be an understatement. Within the last week, I've had the unfortunate duty to report on a series of toddler rapes in India. With the publicity hitting India after these vicious attacks, authorities are now planning on additional reforms that would further speed up rape trials and lower the age at which juveniles can be prosecuted as adults. The Juvenile Justice Act, the country's primary legal framework for minors, currently defines a person under the age of 18 as a child and caps punishment to three years in a correctional home. The Delhi government is looking to change that by allowing those 15 years and older to be tried as adults. They're also hoping to add several fast-track courts to handle rape cases. The two cases this past week triggered protests, and Delhi's chief minister, Arvin Kedrawal, said he set up a panel of ministers to examine ways to curb sex crimes and strengthen the security of women and children. Over the weekend, Kedrawal blamed the city's police for failing to stem the rising cases of sexual violence and reiterated a demand that the federal government hand over control of the police forces to local authorities. But police officials said it would be difficult, as the victims were often known to their attackers. Data on sexual assaults now show a 9% increase in sexual assaults from 2014 and that 86% of the attacks have been committed by a close family member such as fathers, brothers, uncles, as well as neighbors, employers, and co-workers, as well as friends. It also revealed that nearly 40% of the victims were under the age of 18. A little over a year ago, I mentioned that Tetsuya Kato, former Seoul bureau chief for the Senkai Shimbun, was indicted on defamation charges related to a Japanese language report he filed following the sinking of the South Korean ferry Sewol. In his report, Cato cited rumors floating around South Korea's financial districts and alluded to in a chosen Ilbo article printed in July of 2014. Cato disclosed a rumor about President Park Geun-hye being romantically involved at the time of the sinking, rather than addressing the matter hands-on. The president then lashed out, saying Cato's article was a deliberate attempt to undermine her position. An investigation into Cato ensued, and on October 8th, he was indicted. The trial phase has just about run its course, with sentencing expected to take place on November 26th of this year. The prosecution is seeking an 18-month jail term. Benjamin Ishmael, the head of Reporters Without Borders Asia-Pacific Desk, said, quote, Prosecuting a journalist for questioning the president's actions is inconceivable in a state that regards itself a democracy. We urge the South Korean judicial authorities not to impose a prison sentence which would be disproportionate and to take account of the fact the offending article was based on reports already accessible online whose authors have not been prosecuted. End quote. Reporters Without Borders and other free press observers are correct to call out South Korea on this issue as the reason for what is perhaps best described as a witch hunt revolves around the fact that Kato is Japanese and works for a newspaper that is largely perceived as anti-Korean in Seoul. South Korea is ranked 60th out of 180 countries in the 2015 Reporters Without Borders Press Freedom Index, falling in that index for the past four consecutive years. It's a nation where releasing factual information can still land one in jail. When speaking to people out on the street, a number support the government's stance in this case and on the topic of defamation which seems to indicate it's impossible for anyone to receive a fair shot if you go against the popular narrative. In my opinion, the greatest casualty that stemmed from the 1950 to 1953 Korean War was the damage inflicted on families. Following the division of the peninsula at the end of World War II, the nation has never been the same. This week, Koreans on both sides of the demilitarized zone gathered at Mount Kumgang to restore family ties that were cut during that conflict. This week's reunion marks the 20th such time they've been allowed to happen since family members are prohibited from exchanging phone calls or letters on a regular basis. This batch of reunions also include 90 South Koreans and 96 North Koreans who have been cut off from their family members for more than 60 years. Jun Hyun Kok, an 80-year-old South Korean, will meet his younger sister in North Korea and spoke to VOA. 
He said, quote, I have never seen her since we separated during the war. I became so excited about the news that I could not sleep. I simply cannot express my feeling. End quote. When seeing the reports of the reunions, one can't help but to be touched by the stories emerging, especially the one about the husband and wife that have been separated for 65 years. But I have to wonder what kind of reunion it will really be. After all, they're having the event at the Mount Kumgong Resort, where the DPRK can closely monitor and control every aspect of the meeting. Even with the long-lost family members being allowed to meet, it's under watchful eyes, fearful that news from the South will trickle in and wreak havoc among the populace. Past reports have also noted that those from the North can't speak freely and tout the glory of the Kim family. So yeah, it's a family reunion. You get to see your long-lost family members, but you don't get to truly see them. For those nearing the end of their lives, it may be enough to foster some sort of closure on a lifetime of separation. But let's call what it really is. Propaganda. What's more than 2,500 years old, stretches for more than 13,000 miles, can be seen from space and, believe it or not, disappearing? You guessed it, the Great Wall of China. We all know the history. The wall was built in ancient times to keep the Mongols out. And while it wasn't all too successful at that endeavor, today the wall's greatest foe are those taking it apart, brick by brick. Yeah, the touristy areas are well protected and maintained, but that only accounts for roughly 25% of the wall's length. The rest of it doesn't fare so nicely and get the love it so dearly needs. Hyo Jin Ren, a Great Wall volunteer, said, quote, In the summer of 2014, we discovered that the walls were toppled. There were people buying scorpions from villagers to make Chinese medicine. And each scorpion was worth five cents. Five cents meant nothing to adults, but was appealing to children. Since scorpions resided between bricks, children toppled the Great Wall to catch them. End quote. Since these rural areas had no tourists, there was nothing preventing the residents from diving in and taking the wall apart to get at these scorpions. Now, there is more at play than just the locals looking for scorpions. The unprotected areas are especially susceptible to erosion factors since they aren't afforded any kind of protection. Several municipal governments have pledged more funds and to work to protect this legacy structure. But unless something actually comes to fruition, most of the Great Wall is on its way to extinction. For more stories like these, don't miss the Asia Brief Monday through Thursday mornings on our website or in your favorite podcast application. That's it for the news, but before I wrap things up, here are just a few of your comments. Lucas Musser says, I'm all for the U.S. or any other military doing as it pleases through that area in the West Philippine Sea, as it has not and most likely will not be verified by the U.N. as China's sovereign territory. So if China fires on any vessel going through that area they occupy illegally, it's going to be bad news for them. Three Goku says, is this any different from South Korea, Japan, and the United States challenging China's extended air defense perimeter a while back? China, in the last several years, has changed the status quo in the region, and no one has done anything concrete to change that. The real question is how far is the U.S. willing to go? On the opinion article we shared from the Hangora entitled Park Gen Hei, an internal girl with a father complex, Barry Harvey said, and this is exactly why no one takes her seriously when she complains about Japan doing the same thing. You can't have your cake and eat it too. Matthew Nolan added, her father was also a Japanophile, but she seems to be ignoring that part too. Perdamont left this comment on our podcast about the number of child rapes in India. It's for people like these that the death penalty was created. This is pure evil, plain and simple. Hey, I'd like to extend my thanks to everyone who took the time out to send in comments this week. I truly do appreciate it. And if you have a thought or an opinion on any one of the stories in this episode, I'd love to hear from you. So please write in or record yourself and mail in that audio file. 
And remember, I am away for the weekend, so there won't be any new podcasts until Tuesday, but I will continue to share the news via social media. Hey, my friends, if you enjoyed this week's podcast, I hope you'll do me a favor and share it with your friends. And if you haven't, subscribe. Subscribing is free and easy to do. Just go to our website, asianewsweekly.net, and click on the subscribe tab. You can also subscribe in your favorite podcast application like iTunes or Stitcher. Now, if you want to keep up with more news from the region, be sure to follow Asian News Weekly on Facebook or Twitter. And of course, if you have any questions, comments, or feedback, I'd love to hear from you. The email address to write to is podcast at asianewsweekly.net. My name is Steve Miller, and I'd like to thank you so much for listening this week. So until next time, be true to yourself and always be awesome.